of God and then have a good time. So, so today, uh, in science school class, we've been talking about and studying about David, King David. And King David is one of my favorite characters of the Bible of all time. Because David was a real person. He had emotions. He had struggles. There are times, if you read the, the book of Psalms, one Psalm will say if, of David, you know, praise God, God's with me, I'm doing great. The very next one, God, where are you? Why are you hiding from me? Where is your face? And that's why I really appreciate David so much because his emotions were out there for us to, to see. So today we're going to talk about emotions. And one particular emotion is anger. And that's why I asked you earlier about the road construction because sometimes it can be very frustrating. It can make you feel a little bit angry. But we're going to talk about anger today. Now, how many of you know that God made us who we are, including all of our emotions? Anger, sadness, anxiety, depression, no matter what emotion you're going through, God had emotions. On Wednesday nights, come on out Wednesday nights, we have a really good teacher, Bill. Bill preached last week. We've been studying the book of Numbers. And in the book of Numbers, God was angry with Israel almost every day. Right? Jesus was angry. Remember? He went into his, the temple and found out there were people cheating the people using inferior types of uh, uh, sacrifices. And what did Jesus do? He threw them out, overturned the tables. Jesus was angry. It's okay. How many of you know it's okay to be angry? You know, we can get anger, we can have anger over things we see that are, uh, are wrong. We can get angry over injustice. But that's okay. However, we're going to look at a time where it wasn't okay. We're going to look at a period in David's life where he got angry, and it could have been a big, big major mistake, and it could have affected him when he became king as well. If in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. So being anger, having anger, that's okay. While you're angry, don't sin. Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. E Ecclesiastes 7.9, do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. We're going to look at today, David almost became a fool. James 1.20, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So we're going to, like I said, we're going to take a look at an event in David's life that could have been a disaster for him if he would have allowed his anger to get the best of him. So we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 25. So go over, uh, turn over there, or if you have an uh, e-Bible, turn it on and get the uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 25. So Kind of a little bit of a background of where he's at. To, to tell you a little bit of background first that will lead into the story we're going to talk about today. So Israel became a nation, and they wanted to be like every other nation, and they wanted a king. So they chose Saul to be king. Even though God warned them, he's going to be a terrible king. They didn't care. They wanted Saul anyway to be just like everybody else. Saul started off pretty good, but he quickly became disobedient to the Lord. He didn't do what the Lord says. And finally, God said, you know what? I'm grieved about Saul. I'm going to remove Saul and put somebody else in his place. So God looked around and he saw David. Now at that time, David, young man, about 17 years old, was a shepherd tending his father's flocks. But there was something about David that God liked. David was a man after all, God's own heart. And so God chose David and anointed him king. But 
David wasn't ready at that point in time to be king. So one day, Israel was in a war with the Philistines, and they had a champion named Goliath. David came out. He was tending his flocks. His father sent him, go check on your brothers. Here's some cheese. See how things are going? You know, what's going on? So when David got to the battlefield, he, know, he noticed the one thing, that the Israelites were scared of the battle because David was such a threatening guy. In today's measurements, Goliath, I'm sorry, I was, Goliath is a threatening guy, not, not David. Goliath, in our uh, measurements today, was a giant. He was nine feet, nine inches tall. And they had this battle where a, represent, a representative from each side would come out and face each other in battle. So, of course, Goliath was their champion. He was chosen by the Philistines, but no one from Israel went out to fight, except for David. And what did he have? A sling with five stones. And David struck down the, the giant, struck down Goliath, and overnight, David was a hero. Just like this. And they were coming back from the battle, coming back to Jerusalem. The young ladies at the time were singing and dancing in the streets. Saul killed his thousands. But David, his what? Ten thousands. And at that moment, Saul became very jealous. Because you imagine, David killed 10,000? It was just one guy, a big guy. It was one guy. So at that moment, David, uh, Saul, excuse me, Saul was jealous of David. And in the course of time, David came in the service of the king. He married Saul's daughter and was put in charge of the army. But Saul had that jealous eye on David and tried to kill him a, a several times. Finally, David had enough. And just like the, the guy, the fugitive from the old 60s TV series, looking for the one-armed man, David fled and went into the wilderness and became a fugitive himself. Now, in the course of time, there were other people that were uh, disenchanted with Saul, Saul's leadership, and they joined David. Eventually, David had 600 of, of men, and probably some women too, you know, surrounding him, which became the basis of his mighty men later on. So David, along with 600 men, were out wandering around the desert, trying to keep away from Saul, because Saul would sometimes come out and try to, try to get him. Now that brings us to this story right here. So if you have your Bibles, uh, chapter 25, 1 Samuel, and starting in verse number 2. Starting in verse number 2. Then David moved down to the desert of Moan, a certain man in Moan who had the property there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband, a Calebite, was surly and mean in his dealings. Okay, first of all, here we got this uh, situation where David comes across a man. Nabal. Now, Nabal, his name means fool. And it's not the kind of fool that is dim-witted. This kind of fool that, that Nabal was, it, it describes us in Psalm 53. The fool in his heart says there is no God. They are corrupt in their ways and vile. There is no one who does good. So Nabal, who was a fool, because he lived his life as there was no God. Which is a foolish thing to do. Believe me. So, there was a, a practice back then. That men would offer protection for uh, farmers, 
who are grazing their livestock or sharing their sheep as a way of protection against other people trying to come and rob and do harm to the, either the men or the livestock there. And so that's what David's men did. David's men offered protection to Nabal, his workers, and his flock during this time that they were sharing the sheep. All right? So Nabal, again, was a foolish man. But in contrast, his wife, Abigail, was described as intelligent and beautiful. And she's a very, very wise woman. So, they, uh, Nabal uh, began to share his sheep. That was all done. So let's, let's take, take a look at the incident here. The incident that made David uh, almost lose it. All right. So, verse number four. While David was in the desert, he heard that Nabal was shearing, shearing sheep. So he sent ten young men and said to him, Go up to Nabal at Carmel, greet him in my name, say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household. Uh, and all good health, and all good health that is yours. Now I hear that it's, it's sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. The, and the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants that they will, and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable toward my young men, since we come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find uh, for them. So what they were doing here was David sent 10 representatives from his fighting men, his, his army, to go and see, hey, maybe Nabal can either pay us or provide us some food or something because we provided a service to him. While we were guarding his sheep and his livestock, nothing was taken. There was no mistreatment. Nothing was harmed. So it's time that they pay us back. So Day was in happy spirits, and he was expecting something good in return. But that's not what Nabal did, because Nabal, again, means fool, and he shows his foolishness right away. All right, take a look at this here. Verse number 9. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal the message that David had told him to give. Ten. Nabal answered, uh, Nabal answered, uh, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their own masters these days. Now why should I take my bread, my food, my water, and give it to your men? All right, so here we go. Nabal didn't uh, do the custom. He didn't give David's men anything. So they sent uh, David's men away. Now let's take a look at what David does when he hears this. 13. David said to his men, put on your swords. So they put on their swords and David put on his about 400 men went up with David while 200 stayed in the, uh, with the supplies. Now take a look at this. What was David's reaction? Anger. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about anger. He was intensely angry. And look what, what the reaction was. 400 men, get your swords ready. We're going to go to war. Now, let me t slow down for one second here. And this is where we can get in trouble if we follow like, like the example of David. Was David's response, did he equal the cause of his anger? No. Some of you might remember this. You ever hear about this? You know, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. It's an old saying back in the day. David was about ready to make a mountain out of a molehill. Sure, the, the thing with Nabal was, yeah, that would probably make me mad too. But David's response was way over the top. But that's not all. So, we'll kind of skip around a little bit there. So one of the servants of Nabal goes and tells Abigail what, what happened. They relayed the story that, hey, David and his men 
Uh, they were guarding us. Nothing was missing. They did not mistreat us. And um, your husband, Nabal the fool, wouldn't repay them. Now, David and 400 men are going to come up and uh, kill us. You got to do something. And I believe you know, Nabal was sent by God to intervene in this situation because Abigail was you know, intelligent and she was very, very wise. So what did Abigail do? She got together a bunch of food and then she quickly went to David and David and his men ate. The food that Nabal wouldn't promised, uh, Abigail provided. So I don't know about you, but after I eat a, a nice meal like that, I'm ready for a nap. You know, I'm not ready to kill anybody. You know, we'll, we'll kill them afterwards, after the nap. I want to lay down, take a nap. Then I'll think about killing later. So that's exactly what happened here. Uh, God used Abigail to come in and put uh, and kind of slow down David. Because look at this. All right, this is in verse uh, uh, number 22. David was still mad. And he told, and so Abigail came to him, and this is what David said to Abigail. Look at this, verse number 22. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. Talking about Nabal. So not only was David going to bring 400 men armed with swords, but he was going to kill every male that I would imagine that these were probably Nabal's uh, workers, his servants. It doesn't indicate that he and Abigail had any children. They might have, but it doesn't say in the Bible. So look at this. Again, David was ready to kill not just Nabal, the one who uh, made him mad, but people, you know, that worked for Nabal. Now, do you see here the rash decision that David could have been, you know, could have made? But let's take a look at this. So after uh, David, like I said, David gets fed, his men get fed, probably like me, probably take a nap. Afterwards, get up. Then he talks to uh, uh, Abigail. Look at this. So oh, in the meantime, Abigail does, does plead. And um, actually, she says, hey, look, look, my husband is a fool. And wherever he goes, folly goes with him. And so that calms David down. After a while, after that talking with uh, Abigail, it calms him down. And look at this. Look at verse number, uh, um, well, actually, go skip up there. Um, go, to, go to verse number 31. This is what Abigail says to David. He says, look, look, he says this, My master will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or having avenged himself. So, so Abigail pointed out to David that if you would have gone through with your plan of killing everybody, that could have been a disaster for you when you get on the throne. And who knows, if David would have done this I don't know would God allow him to go on the throne I don't know thank God we, we, we don't find out thank God David does the right thing so Abigail because she's wise tells David of the potential consequences of his anger so David look in verse number 32 he said to Abigail praise be to the Lord the God of Israel who has sent you here to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day, from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God uh, of Israel, lives, who have kept me from harming you. Now, you have not come quickly to meet me. Not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive at daybreak. To you about today are going to help you Dealing with your emotions, not just anger, although 
this uh, passage deals a lot with anger, but these skills can help you with your anxiety, depression, uh, every type of emotion you're going through, you know, they can, they can help you out. Now, in this passage here, David had Abigail to come in and stop him before he was going to do something that's foolish. For some of you, you might have your wife stop you from doing something foolish. But there are times where God doesn't provide you an Abigail or your wife's not around to stop you from doing something dumb that you later regret. So when you're by yourself, when you're driving around in the Twin Cities, getting frustrated about the road construction, about, oh, there's a new detour. That wasn't here yesterday. Now it's here today. Now I've got to find a new way to get to work or get home. And you're getting ready to get angry. Here are some skills. So the first one, if you can turn the slide there, Britt. Okay, now these skills here, they're designed to help slow down the time before we act upon an emotion. Now just take, take a look at this. David, what would happen if Abigail did not get to David in time? What would happen, Jerry? He would have killed all those men. And how many times in our anger do we do something, sometimes you get so angry, so frustrated that we do something without thinking? How many are guilty of that? One time I sent a map book back because I didn't, I was mad. I, you know what? I ordered, I ordered this Mac book. And two weeks later, a new model came out, was better and cheaper. So I got mad and sent the other one back. But I didn't get a computer then. I was just, I was without a computer because I didn't think it through. All right, so, all right, so, the, okay, again, these skills I'm going to teach you are designed to slow down that time so that you're not acting just like that, but you have time to think back. Okay, the next one, Brett, moment to pause. The moment to pause skill. Three steps in that one. Take a deep breath. You're, you're dealing with your anger. Take a deep breath. Check in with yourself to identify what is your impulse. Well, that's, I hope I don't get you angry, Jerry. <laughs> David's impulse was to kill. But check in with your impulse. All right? And I know, um, well, today's August. August. August means what? Preseason football. And you know, what, you know what's around the corner? The Vikings are playing. The Vikings are playing. And you got to check in with yourself. If you're sitting out, you're watching your Vikings play, and they blow the game, but you don't get angry and throw whatever you're in your hand at the TV to break your big, scary TV. All right? So, we, so here's the thing is, you take a deep breath. You kind of take an inventory of yourself, check in with what you want to do. It's a good time, uh, people, to pray, right? Pr you know, uh, a couple weeks ago, Pastor, you've been talking about some of these um, uh, prayers, short prayers. God, help me. God, I'm angry today. I'm frustrated today. God, help me. That is a good time to get in touch with God and, and, and pray about what you're going to do next. So the second thing here, uh, identify other possibilities for your action. Is there other solutions to it? Sometimes you might need to talk to somebody who has some good advice for you, but find out what other things can I do besides doing what I'm going to do? Is there other options? And they say to try to think about these three options, other options that, that you can do. Then finding number three is choose what you want to do with the impulse and feeling. And hopefully by that time, you will make the right choice. You know, for some people, uh, especially when their emotions are very high, the, the worst thing you can do is make a decision right away. Sometimes you might need to sleep on it. And how many of you ever found that, that you are faced with a, a terrible problem, you see no answer, but you go to bed, get a good night's sleep, by the next morning, oh, the, you know, the problem kind of resolves itself. Anybody find that to be true? 
So the, the, the best thing you can do when you're uh, highly emotional is to do nothing, right? Don't, don't do anything. But just wait until your mind and your emotions are in a much better place. See, see, look, look, David, he was highly emotional. He wanted to kill, but Abigail came in, calmed him down. Now, David was in a much calmer place because when he was angry, that's almost insane. And we could be that way too. Our anger can get the best of us. All right, the second skill, very similar to the first one, it's called the stop skill. Okay, there it is. First one, no surprise, is stop. Then take a step back. Again, take a step back, check in with yourself, um, pray, find out what the best solution is. The third thing is to observe. Observe, okay, if I go through with my anger, what would I want to do with my anger? What would, that, what would happen? What would that look like? If I choose this option, what would that look like? All right, choose the best way. Observe what could happen. Then, then for, uh, number four is to proceed mindfully. What's the best way to do this? What's, again, if you're Christians, what's the best way that you can do that's pleasing to God? And then finally... The last skill is the, uh, what is it, opposite to emotion. So go put that slide up there. All right, this one, very similar to, uh, I showed you three of them. Use the one that helps you the best. Is number one, is identify your emotion. For David, what was it? Anger, intense anger. Number two, what is your urge because of the emotion? What do you want to do? Kill everybody. Then number three, is do something opposite that urge. So if, if his urge is to kill somebody, opposite is not to kill anybody. In which he did. Because he allowed himself, through Abigail, to set, you know, get his mind calmed down. And he didn't calm, and he didn't kill anybody. So these are some of the skills we teach at, at work. Um, they're designed, again, like I said, for all types of emotions to help you to think things through. Now, the last thing here, and we're almost done, is this. God, uh, David waited for God's response. Take a look at this. Thirty-six. When Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the household holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk. She told him nothing until daybreak. Then in the morning, when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things, and his heart failed him, and it became like a stone. Well, you're getting ahead of the story there, Jerry, but yeah, he dies. About 10 days later... The Lord struck Nabal, and he died. When David heard this, that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise be to God, the Lord, who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He had kept his servant from doing wrong, but then it left room for God to deal with it. And God did deal with it. Nabal was, was killed, uh, David was happy. He was so happy he married Abigail. And they lived heavily, uh, heavily after after. The, the key is this. Look, folks. We, are, we all have emotions. All right? God made us emotional. But be careful that if your emotion starts to get to the best of you, don't do anything stupid and dumb, which is biblical, by the way, stupid and dumb, that will cause you some, some harm or cause everybody else harm. Pray about it, do the wise thing, and allow God to carry on your cause. Thank you. God bless. Troy, you want to come back up or you want to?
I'm glad you had that number three point in there, do something opposite the urge, because when you said find a different course of action, my thought is, do I have to kill them or can I just chop off their legs? Would that work? But do something opposite that urge. It's not enough to just not kill if you want to maim. Just saying. And I know what traffic is like in around here. It can make us all so angry that we want to maim somebody. But we have within us the ability to take a step back and breathe and respond. It's not by mistake that the last fruit of the Spirit is self-control. God has given us, through the Holy Spirit, the ability to control ourselves. So as we get ready to close out this running, let's stand up. I'm pretty sure that all of us have been in David's shoes. And we didn't have an Abigail come in to stop us. And we did stupid and dumb things that we probably need to take a minute and repent of and and say we're sorry for. Um, and also to, the, the thing about repentance is it's not, it's not just saying sorry, it's committing to walking the other direction. To do, to doing it right, to taking that, to taking the time to follow these steps, when we find ourselves in a situation where we want to let our emotions take control. So let's uh, let's pray. Let's ask God for His strength as we go forward. Let's uh, confess those times, and not out loud because nobody needs to know, but confess those times when we have blown it because we all do and thank god for his grace lord thank you so much for who you are as was pointed out you had anger you have anger it's not wrong that we have anger but the way that we allow that anger to work itself out in our lives is wrong sometimes and lord for those times when we have for those times when we have allowed our anger to take control when we have allowed our desire to take control when we have allowed any emotion to take control and we have done things that have hurt people or hurt ourselves or just hurt your cause lord we are sorry we apologize. We repent right now. And Lord, we thank you that you have given us through the Holy Spirit the fruit of self-control. Help us all as we go forward to practice that self-control that you have given us. Lord, help us to remember in that moment when we want to say that thing or do that thing or make that post or whatever it is that we want to do, help us to take a step back and remember to let our conversation be seasoned with salt and with grace. Lord, that we would be truly your representatives here and not representatives of our emotions. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great afternoon. See you at 6. And you're right, Chris. The first preseason game is Friday. <laughs>